Okay, welcome everyone, it's time to start. It is my great pleasure and honor to announce today's speaker, Professor Peter Dayan. Peter studied mathematics at Cambridge University and received his doctorate from the University of Edinburgh. After postdoctoral research at the Salk Institute and the University of Toronto, he moved to the MIT as assistant professor in 1995. In 1998, he moved to London to help co-found the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit which became one of the best known institutions for research in theoretical neuroscience. In 2018, Peter moved to Tübingen to become a director of the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. In 2012, Peter received the Rummelhart Prize for contributions to the theoretical foundations of human cognition. In 2017, the Brain Prize from the Greta Lundbeck European Brain Research Foundation. And in 2018, he was elected as fellow of the Royal Society of the United Kingdom. In 2019, he became fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Peter Dayan was also awarded an Alexander von Humboldt professorship, which is Germany's most highly endowed research prize. So Peter's research focuses on decision-making processes in the brain, the role of neuromodulators, as well as neural, neuronal malfunctions in psychiatric uh, diseases. He has long worked at the interface between natural and engineered systems for learning and choice, and is also regarded as a pioneer in the field of artificial intelligence. I am sure that his work on, for example, the Helmholtz machine, Q-learning and Bayesian modeling has been an inspiration to many of us, and I assume that a copy of his classic uh, textbook, Theoretical Neuroscience, sits on many of our desks. So today, Peter will tell us all about his recent work in his Donders lecture entitled Peril, Prudence and Planning as Risk, Avoidance and Worry. If you have any questions for Peter, then please post them via the Ask a Question button. Uh, we will take some time after the lecture to address a couple of these questions. So Peter, we are all very excited to hear about your latest insights. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much indeed. C can you hear me now? So it's a, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to, to come here. Thank you so much for that lovely, generous introduction. So I'm really sorry that I can't come in person to, to Nijmegen again. I really enjoyed my visits. I've been there before. It's nice to, to meet some colleagues and some old friends and some old colleagues and in, in, in this talk. So today I'm indeed going to talk about some work that we've done recently on risk um, and uh, risk averse behavior and ruminative planning. Can you see my, I think you probably can't see my screen. Let me make sure that you can see the, can you see the, can you see the slides? Yeah, here we go. Um, and uh, so I want to acknowledge the person who's done the, uh, the vast bulk of this work is Chris Gagney, who's a postdoc with me in, uh, in Tübingen. Um, so the plan for this talk is I want to talk about risk aversion as a, as a whole um, and talk about different measures that you might have for the way that risk might work. And in cognitive neuroscience and computational neuroscience, we've generally used some rather simple measures of risk. But the field of risk, in, really from the, from the fields of economics, has some much more sophisticated measures, which have also slightly permeated, um, slightly permeated in the field of, of um, reinforcement learning. And so I want to talk about how we can use one of those measures and what, it ha what implications it has for thinking about uh, planning and also rumination too. So I'll talk about two different versions of the thing called conditional um, value at risk. Um, so there's a, we'll talk about two different versions and the slightly different properties they have. Talk about how that leads to risk averse online behavior in the context of sequential decision making problems. And then I'll talk about risk averse offline planning and talk about the links between that and sort of optimize replay and rumination. And we'll try and relate this a little bit to anxiety disorders. So one backdrop for this is the general field of computational psychiatry, which of course Nijmegen is a very strong, has lots of expertise in with uh, Roshan and uh, Hanukkah and, and, and others too. So one way of splitting up the pie in computational psychiatry, which I like, is um, to think about it in terms of different sorts of problems. So what, if we think of the context of decision making, how could decision making go wrong? So one way it can go wrong is, you know, this is sort of the spirit is weak, but the flesh is willing. So in a sense, the, you can think of this as the, the, you have the right mechanisms for solving problems, but the problems that you're solving, posed in this case, posed by the spirit, are incorrect problems. So in the context of risk and anxiety, you could imagine that people who are extremely risk sensitive are essentially uh, computing optimal solutions to over to what the rest of society might consist might consider to be over risk sensitivity. You could also have the the, the idea that you have the, the the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. So you could have an incompetent way of trying to solve a correct problem. 
And uh, we'll see that this also, perhaps in the context of rumination, I'll try and argue that maybe this is one of the things that can go on in that context, where you're trying to solve the right problem, but the mechanisms you have for solving it are not um, uh, fit for the task. So that's the wrong solution. And then the third possibility is you have the right, you're trying to solve the right problem with the right means, but the way that you set that um, up in the first place was in an environment, in this case, you know, like a desert environment, and maybe the environment has now changed, so going from being the desert to being this sort of lush rainforest, in which the optimal behavior will be different. And there are various cases in the context of, of, of psychiatry in which, um, for instance, your willingness to explore the world, to find out the world might have changed now to afford these opportunities, is, has, uh, is, has gone away because of the way that you're solving the problems correctly. And we'll argue that that might also have some resonance in the context of risk and anxiety too. Uh, so we call that the wrong environment. Um, okay, so let's talk about risk. So risk is obviously an extremely critical aspect of many aspects of decision-making problems. So, you know, we think of car accidents, bankruptcy, of course, you know, these days we're extremely sensitive to many aspects of risk because of the, because of uh, COVID. So risk always involves decision-making with respect to uncertainty, right? It's where there's something uncertain you don't know about that could cause these problems. And indeed, whole industries have been designed around it. So this is the, this is Lloyd's of London, you know, the Luton's Bell. So insurance markets are, um, are obviously relevant for this. And uh, particularly for psychiatry, it likely plays a very crucial role in many aspects of psychopathology. So I think so aspects of anxiety and mania. And in particular, in the context of anxiety and things like post-traumatic stress disorder, you have this uh, chains of rumination, this sort of ruminative what ifs, where if an you know, accident happens, you might be thinking about what if I'd done something different? What if you know, I, my coffee had been colder in the morning, so I'd have drunk it faster, so I wouldn't have been out there in the street when the, when the car could run me over, or so forth. And so understanding something about the way that we plan in the context of risk and the way that that can go wrong, then is very important for these, these, these uh, powerful and uh, upsetting um, diseases, dysfunctions you can see in psychopathology. So in our field, risk has often been operationalized in a relatively simple way. So here's an example of a, of a, of a sort of two um, choice task. So you can go left or right. In this instance, if you go left, you get some small amount of you know, money. You know, maybe you win pounds, like 10, 10 pounds worth almost nothing. Um, or if you go right, in this case, you take a risk. And in this case, you have some chance of getting um, nothing or some chance of winning, winning big. And then in this instance, this sort of experiment, the color of the ring tells you what the probability is that if you take the risk, you're going to get this, this, get this big outcome. So this is a very one very standard way of thinking about risk. But these are extremely simple paradigms where you only have essentially, um, you know, you're making a single choice. And the question that we're going to talk about in this talk really is, I think, the more interesting collection of tasks which are the sort of sequential decision-making tasks, which we are all often looking at in, the, in uh, reinforcement learning. So here's a very simple example. You have a person in a, um, a little agent in an extremely simple one-dimensional maze. The, uh, the agent can stay where, where they are, they can go left or right, but the actions have some transition error, like 10% transition error. When you want to go left, you have some chance of going right or staying where you are. And then there are two rewards in the world, one worth one on the right-hand side, one worth two on the left-hand side. But there's also what uh, Chris loves to call a lava pit, shown here by this icon, which is worth minus 10, um, uh, minus 10 units. And so, of course, this, in some sense, is to set up the idea that this is a risky choice, because although you get a bigger reward here, so you have an incentive to try and get there, Nevertheless, you're, there's, a, there's a, a chance of getting to this um, lava pit, in which case then you'll, you'll lose a lot of money and, and, and then uh, lose a lot of points, and that will be very unfortunate. So we, what we'd like to do is to understand, so in this case, we'd like to understand the choices you're making, the risk-sensitive choices, and also the risk-sensitive rumination. Now, what, do you, what are you thinking about if you're trying to think about planning in a domain like this? Where should you um, devote your resources to doing planning? And we think that this should be um, controllable, should be influenced by risk. Okay, so what sort of risk measures could we think about that would then give us some hints as to how you should plan in this context? So what, or, since we argue that when you're thinking about risk, you're thinking about dis uncertainty, so we think about distributions of outcomes. So here's uh, some distribution of potential rewards, um, so which could be positive or negative. This is a uh, you know, some distribution function. 
And so one way of thinking about this is this is what you can get. And we'd like to understand how risky is, you know, or how can we understand both the mean of this, which is here is just slightly positive, but then also be sensitive in some way to the risk. So one standard thing you could do, in fact, this dates back to the very early days of thinking about probabilistic reasoning, is to use some sort of nonlinear utility function. So you have a utility function which says that, you know, for instance, maybe negative outcomes are, are, have a subjective worth which is extremely negative, and positive outcomes have a worth which, you know, which saturates um, you know, fairly quickly. And in that case, you would be very sensitive to negative outcomes. The trouble with that is it's very um, rigid, right? It depends on exactly how you set that utility function up. And so that's not very adaptive to the domain that you have. Another way that people have thought about it, this is very common in the, so this sort of Markovitzian model, very common in the finance community, is to think about something like a mean return minus some positive quantity times the variance. So that says if you have a big variance, that means that then if beta is a positive, then you downweigh the quality of the mean according to the size of the variance, and then you won't want to do, won't, won't want to make those choices either. So this has the problem that it equalize, equally penalizes positive and negative risk. So sort of good variance in terms of the chance of getting a big reward is, also, is somehow equated also with bad variance where you might get a negative reward instead. And also, um, this rule is not what's called a sub-additive. So you, one other sort of things you might like from a risk measure is the idea that diversification will lead to lower risk. So there's a sense in which when you're moving around the um, in different sorts of environments, you, you can sort of diversify your risk by the sorts of choices you make. We'll see an example of that later. And there's a notion that comes from the finance of community uh, about coherent risk measures, which satisfy a, bunch, a, a few properties, which means that they uh, do things like the fact that diversification should be a, should reduce risk in a way that is, is actually rather intuitive. And this Markovitzian utility does not have that characteristic. So um, one thing that we would like to think about also from a psychiatric point of view is to focus on the um, on the worst possible outcomes, the lower, the lower tail of outcomes. So I think here's our distribution. We don't care so much about you know, the possibility that really, really nice things might happen, but we do reasonably care about the possibility that really nasty things might happen. And animals should do the same in the context of things like, say, predation, where, they, of course, they, you know, that's a really nasty outcome for, their, for, for, for the animals themselves. And this is natural in medicine, finance, engineering, and, and in many of these other contexts, uh, too. So what we'd like to have is a risk measure that somehow focuses on the lower tail of the distribution. And that will capture the idea that nasty things are, are around. So um, one of the ways of thinking about the lower tail is in terms of quantiles of the distribution. So um, here's an example where we have a set of possible outcomes, so minus four up to three. These are a set of probabilities for each of those outcomes. So this is one single choice. Again, we're still in, this, in the non-sequential domain, and we're going to think about what risk looks like here before generalizing it to the sequential case. So the average value here is um, uh, designed to be just, uh, I think, a little bit less than zero, but not very much less than zero. But if you're worried about lower tails, a natural thing to do is to say uh, is a quantity called the value at risk, which is really just the lower quantile. So here the, we've chosen a quantile, which is the 0.3 quantile. So this is 30% of the outcomes live in, the lower 30% of outcomes live, are shown by this dark blue, darker blue area. So that's called the value at risk. But it turns out that, so you might think, well, isn't that a good risk measure to use? And so if we make alpha more extreme, we make it you know, 0 0.05, then we put our value, we put our value at risk would be here. And indeed, that is very much about the lower tail of the distribution. So it turns out that that is also not a coherent risk measure. It doesn't have these nice properties like diversification I talked about. But there's a, um, this thing called the conditional value at risk, which is just the average value of all those outcomes which fit into this lower quantile. So here, the, the quantile is the same, shown by this dark blue area. And the average value of those is called the conditional value at risk at that particular quantile level. And that is a coherent risk measure that I'm going to argue is a really good measure for us to think about, because it captures the lower tail and has these other nice properties in terms of being coherent. In terms of being coherent. What we're going to think about is what, in, in this talk, is what happens when we adopt this as a risk measure? What implications does that have for planning and what has, what, um, uh, and for, for, for both the online and offline planning? Okay, so it turns out that these coherent risk measures have a particularly nice, um, uh, they're, so they're sort of almost like a dual view of them. 
So here what I'm showing you is for that same set of outcomes, uh, here are the CVARs at these conditional value at risk at different levels of alpha. So alpha is one, means that you, can t you use the whole distribution. So your quantile you consider is every possible outcome, which means the mean of those is just the regular mean. And then as we get towards alpha equals zero, in fact, alpha is zero, um, tends to zero, then you just look at the single minimum, the worst possible outcome that can happen. Then as we change alpha from one towards zero, as we decrease it, you get increasingly risk sensitive. So you're increasingly focusing on the lower and lower tail. And these black dashed lines show you what those mean values look like. So formally, sorry for the horrible notation, um, but essentially the formally this um, CVAR value is, as I said, it's the expected value of those outcomes which fit into this lower tail. And so we can write that this lower tail is this value at risk, and that's what this expression means. But there's another really intuitive way to think about it, which I think also makes sense from a psychiatric point of view, which is you could think that what you're really going to do is somehow you put a higher chance than is actually true on bad outcomes happening. So this is the true probability of each of those outcomes. And indeed, at alpha equals one, this is how you would evaluate those outcomes themselves. So between, you know, this is the, the true probability so between 0 0.5 for minus four and 0 0.5 for three and everything in between. And you can show, or it can be shown, that if you, to compute the, um, the CVAR value at a lower value of alpha, so here, this is the 30% uh, quantile, this is what I showed here that what you can do is effectively to re-weight those outcomes where you put an excess weight on bad outcomes compared to good outcomes. And what happens is that there's a constraint on that re-weighting, which says that you, um, there's a sort of maximum amount of re-weighting you can do, and then it, it still has to add up to be a prob probability distribution. And the constraint process says that we can re-weight them, that's these uh, psi parameters here, by a maximum of 1 over alpha. So if alpha is 0.3, we can multiply these numbers by a maximum of 1 over 0 0.3, so basically 3 and a third or something like that. And then you just you keep on marching through this distribution, reweighting them, until you essentially run out of probability mass. And formally, you can write that in this, um, in this little optimization uh, process. But the way to think about it is, what we're doing is taking nasty outcomes and making them more likely than they should be by an amount which comes with a constraint. And that's really going to be the, uh, a very powerful tool when we think about things like Bellman equations. So when we're trying to work out optimum policies and optimum values, it turns out we're going to do that by thinking about how this reweighting works. So these are two complementary views of how, um, of how uh, CVAR, how this conditional value at risk operates. Um, okay, so just to sum up uh, briefly on, on CVAR, so it's a coherent risk measure. It has really good properties for the things that we, we need. It emphasizes the lower tail. That's what we care about from a psychiatric point of view and also from other sort of risk point of views. So alpha equals one, it's just the regular mean. So it, it generalizes the regular mean. As alpha tends to zero, it becomes just the worst case. We'll see that's a particularly interesting problem from a psychiatric point of view. There you get this minimum, just the minimum possibility. And then you have this equivalence between this, the way that we construed it as this average value to essentially distorting the probabilities that favor bad outcomes, which I think is a really nice property. Okay, so that's the static case where there's a single decision. Let's now think about the sequential case. And here there's, there are really two very different versions which have some interestingly different properties, which I want to share with you. Um, so imagine that we're in a little, teeny tiny little world where we have a start state and then with probably 0.1, so 10%, we get to what is essentially a bad outcome, why we call it B. And with 90% probability, we get to a good outcome, which is called G. And what we mean by that is that here, we, in, for the B case, we still have a distribution of outcomes, but they're all negative, all less than zero. In the good case, we have a distribution of outcomes, but they're all positive, they're all greater than zero. And now what we want to do is to think about how should we think about the risk of this choice, if you like, or this you know, this, um, this uh, possibility, the, uh, if we start at S, when these are the sequential things that could happen, right? One of two things can happen. We need to worry about what the risk is like. So from the perspective of S, then the, the distribution of what can happen, given these uh, probabilities, is just shown like this. So then, you know, because this has a low probability, so it gets suppressed, these ones have a 90% probability, so they get, you know, they're comparatively higher. So now, if we think about this distribution as a whole, it means that we now, um, if we think about the CVAR value at alpha is 
That, of course, means that all, if you think about this distribution, all the contributors to this low value tail here come from B. They come from this mode of the distribution. None of them come from this mode of the distribution. So if you were to do our reweighting the way I talked about it, what you'd do is you'd re-weight all of these to have probability zero. And these ones will all have uh, probability um, that these would then essentially be reweighted. So all the possibility now goes on to B instead of G. And so now what that amounts to saying is that then to work out the, the, um, the conditional value of risk here, we are going to um, uh, only go down and follow this B path, all the down the nasty path, because this is our, this is, these are only these that contribute to that value. But having got here, each of them contributes exactly the same because they all have this common weighting in this distribution at the top, the S distribution, which means that we now have to change our degree of risk sensitivity having gone down this path. So we are highly risk sensitive in choosing to go down this path, that's the B path, but having gotten there, we now have to change our mind about how risk sensitive we are, we have to reweight it. So another way of thinking about that is that we are, are, it's like a sequential gambler's fallacy. So we started out, we now believe that we're going to be unlucky going from S to B, but having believed we're going to be unlucky to this tune of 0.1, now we can essentially reweight our luck and say we've already consumed all our unluck. And now we are, in this instance, now we're now completely risk neutral when we get to this B, to this B, to get down to this bad outcome. And each of these now contributes equally. We don't have to uh, overweight the nasty outcomes in the B context itself. This isn't the only way to do it, but this is the, the way which is called, so we're going to call this a pre-committed CVAR or PCVAR. Because in a sense, what we're doing is we're, re we're reflecting everything relative to this start state at the beginning. And that means we're now going to have to reweight our risk when we get to the next state, because otherwise we're going to over weight the risk and you'll see that uh, that can happen in, in another sort of risk measure. Okay, so um, formally what we're doing is we're taking the whole distribution of outcomes. So if in a sequential case we think of R, the reward we get plus gamma times the next reward plus gamma squared times the subsequent reward and so forth. And we just compute this conditional value at risk of this whole series of outcomes. So in this case, the only outcome value happened at the bottom and it, we made gamma equal one. So it's a very simple case where it's not, not so complicated. But here we're thinking about the conditional value at risk um, starting at the start state. So we're privileging a start state or a home or a nest for an animal. We're computing values, we're computing risk values relative to that. And as I argued, that means we have this really unexpected property in a sense, which is that when you make transitions, we, we, face the, you know, we optimally face this gambler's fallacy. So if you're unlucky in a transition, it means that you've already consumed some of your bad luck, which means that your value of alpha can increase a bit, which means you can afford to be a little bit less unlucky in the future. But if you are lucky in an outcome, now you have to be more risk sensitive because you've, you've, you've sort of explored a bit of the, of the positive tail. And if you're going to think about the, from the perspective of the start state, all the nasty things that can happen, now you have to believe yourself to be even more unlucky in the future in order to explore components of that really nasty tail. And then alpha equals zero and one are special. So alpha equals one, uh, which you, you're just calculating the mean. In that case, you always stick at alpha equals one. Nothing ever changes. You never become more or less unlucky because you could never distort the probabilities. Alpha equals zero, you're looking for the minimum, the worst possible case. And in this case, you also never, you're, you're, you always have a maximal distortion of probabilities. You're always focusing on the worst possible thing. So again, you never have to become more or less unlucky. You're always as unlucky as it is possible to be in the domain if you use alpha equals zero. And so you're always looking for the minimum, a bit like um, H infinity control. So how, but now we have a, a really, we now have another problem, right? Which is that we are changing alpha as we go along, right? Alpha becomes more or less unlucky. We're searching for more or less risk as a function of how far down the, down the tree we've gone, depending on what's happened in the past. Were we lucky before or unlucky? So we can get to the same state in the world. If we got there by being lucky, now we have to be more risk sensitive. If we got there by being unlucky, now we have to be less risk sensitive. So which means that either we have history dependent evaluation or you have to essentially create another dimension of control. So now we have 
uh, states in the world, so where you are in the real world, which state in the, you know, where you're at B or A, G, or in our little maze, where you are uh, in the state location. But we now have to add another whole dimension, which is our alpha dimension, where the transitions in this risk dimension actually are tied to the way that you distort probability. So I won't go through the details of that. But it means that we have to basically solve, take what is, for instance, a one-dimensional problem in the case of our simple maze, and make it into a two-dimensional problem, where the second dimension is a risk dimension in which you also make moves. Um, so let me not go through that. So how does this look in our random walk? Right, so this is the case, the, the one I started at the beginning, where we have this agent where the outcomes are, so in this case we have a gamma is 0.9, so we have a real discount factor. Our actions are unreliable, a little bit unreliable, so that you only, if you choose to go left, you only go left at 90%, and then you go, um, the other options, uh, 5% or and there's a slight asymmetry I won't talk about. Um, and um, we have these two positive rewards, R equals 1 here and R equals 2 here. And we have this large negative reward where the problem terminates. So if you have a policy which is just uniform at random, so you just choose each of the actions with probably um, a third, then here's the distribution of outcomes, long run outcomes, that you would expect to get if you started at this start state um, here. And so from the CVAR, so here we're going to talk about policy evaluation. So here our policy is just this uniform policy. How, what is it like to be a risk um, sensitive evaluator of this uniform policy? Okay, so here what I'm showing you is um, the values on this scale of minus 10 to plus 10 of the uniform policy at alpha equals one. So this is where you're risk neutral and indeed, there's no reweighting or anything like that. That's just a very simple case. And you can see that, as you might expect, that the value here is um, a, a negative on the to the lava side, and they're nice and positive on the on the um, on the the side of this small reward. So that's for the, that's if you're risk neutral. If you're um, if you adopt the the ultimate risk sensitivity, so now you only care about the worst um, the worst uh, case essentially. Then um, with this uniform policy, this and this discount factor, you can see that, the, that all the possible values, of course, are now all negative, right? So even though on average, right, it's the same policy, it's the same distribution of returns, but now from the perspective of this start state here, if you're adopting this highly risk sensitive value, this this um, this uh, infinite risk sensitivity, so now you only care about the worst case, suddenly the whole world looks horrible because nasty things are can possibly happen. And then as we go up um, with higher, you know, with, between zero and one, what you now see is you get different values of risk, where now different, different values of outcomes, evaluating this uniform policy. And in particular, as I mentioned, what happens is that you have to solve the problem on this, in this whole two dimensions. So even though these white arrows show that we have this uniform policy going left, right, and staying where you are with equal probability, these gray arrows show you that if you are lucky um, uh, and go, so if you're unlucky and go left, which means you're getting a little bit towards the lava pit, then you also move to a value of alpha where you're a little bit less, less um, risk sensitive. If you're unlucky, uh, sorry, <laughs> get this clear. If you're unlucky and go left, you move to a, you're, you move to a higher value of alpha. If you're lucky and you move right, um, then you move to a lower value of, to a higher to a lower value of, of alpha, therefore a higher risk sensitivity. So you move through this whole two-dimensional um, space. So here I've shown you in a in a discretization of that space, but really it's continuous space. And then as you move around, then you're changing your risk sensitivity and changing the values. What I've shown you here by these green colours is the net evaluation, and they show this nice smooth degree of transfer as you go from being highly risk sensitive to being risk neutral. And then, as you can imagine, states become more or less valuable as you come along the way. What we can also do is to optimize our policy and say, now let's find the policy which, um, which optimizes for this PC bar. So now this is a risk sensitive optimization. Now for alpha is one, this is just the regular optimal policy. And so what it does is, as you might imagine, it stays where it is at this at r equals two, stays where it is at r equals one. Then in between, whether it, which way it goes depends on the you know on where exactly where you start. And now the values are much more darker green because of course the optimal value is very good.
The optimal policy from the risk on um, the ultimate risk sensitivity case, actually, it doesn't matter what you do in this domain because we have stochastic transitions. And so any outcome is possible from these cases. It means it doesn't matter whether you choose to go left, right, or stay where you are. It, uh, if you are. If you're only care about the worst possible outcome, you always imagine that worst possible outcome will come, which means that it doesn't change its probability. You know, that worst possible outcome is always going to happen anyway. So one of the things we see actually in anxiety is that um, if, you are, if you are so strongly risk sensitive, it means you have a sort of learned helplessness. It doesn't matter what I do, it's still possible to get run over if you, out, you go outside your, outside your house. It's still possible to get corona through the you know, air conditioning system and go from your neighbors or, or whatever. And so therefore, it doesn't matter. You, protecting yourself is not going to stop the worst possible thing. And then in between, we then have an optimal policy, which again is better than this uniform policy um, of different values. And again, it sort of moves around this two-dimensional space in a way that, um, that makes sense. And as I argued, we have to uh, define our optimal policy relative to a privileged, because it's this pre-committed CVAR, we define it relative to a um, a, a particular state, in this case, the start state was this location, and a particular starting risk value of 0.3. To calculate that policy, you still have to have this whole tableau, this whole two-dimensional tableau, but it's all relative to the risk, the, the, the CVAR risk you have starting at that state itself. Um, another, little, another simple example, here's a case where you have a two-dimensional world you're planning in, so you have a cliff, where there are these lava pits of R is equals minus one here, and you have a single reward of plus three here, and this is where you start. So again, if, you, if you're risk neutral, you just go straight along and you get you know, have a high chance of getting the reward. Um, as you get more risk sensitive, what you do is you avoid the cliff, right? It just makes sense. You're, risk, you're worried about falling over the cliff to get into the lava pit. You want to avoid it. And then the amount you avoid it the, 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 and the values of it then are uh, dependent partly on what this alpha value is. How risk sensitive are you? Which is then a, essentially a personal choice. And this relates to this issue about uh, solving the wrong problem. So if you are highly risk sensitive, then of course you're going to be uh, stay further and further away from the cliff compared to somebody who is risk neutral or even risk seeking, which I'm not showing you here. Okay, so that's PC bar. Now, as I, there's something weird about PCVAR, which is we have this gambler's fallacy, which means, as I argued, that we have to revalue this probability of risk when you, um, when you make a transition in the world from the start state to this bad state. But there's another sort, so that adds complexity to the planning problem itself. But there's another way of doing it in which you, um, which you can keep to the same value of uh, the risk sensitivity, so this alpha bar value here, we're going to call it 0.1, which means that when you get to this state, you reapply the same rule, and you say, I'm now going to, oh, oh, going to think about the average value of things underneath this 10% um, threshold here. And so now I've shown them in red here. So these are just the, so now, even though we've got to this bad outcome, again, we keep the same notion of the thing we're trying to optimize, which is this average value of the lower 10% quant quantile um, uh, decile of that location. And now, when you reflect what that means back at the original start state, that means we're now focusing on this teeny tiny, you can barely even see it, this teeny tiny part of the distribution. And so you're obviously much more risk uh, sensitive by this, uh, this measure. So this measure is, um, we, is called in the literature a nested conditional value at risk. And because what you're doing is you're, say, you're applying a constant rule, you're always applying this, this same CVAR rule as you go, but um, the net effect means that when you think about the start state, you have this much worse outcome, where you're now focusing on a much higher risk outcome. So now, uh, the nesting, we call it, because you apply the CVAR, wherever you get to, you apply the CVAR to, you know, to, to the next value, the next value, the next value. So it's sort of a nested value. So you apply the same value of alpha throughout. So the good news is, of course, that it means you don't have to build the tableau. You can compute this at a single value of alpha bar, because every time you just, you, you never re-weight this alpha bar, you just keep on with a single value of alpha bar. But the bad news is that this can get highly conservative in the way that I showed you in that uh, case. So you get some similar Bellman equations that I go, go through, but, they, but now they live in one dimension rather than these two dimensions. So now uh, we can still ask for what this looks like at different values, at different levels of risk, but now we're not tying the problems together. 
So this is what the, the pre-committed CBAR looked like in the, in the case of the uniform uh, policy. Now we can think about what the end CBAR looks like, the nested one. So again, alpha equals one doesn't change at all. It's just the same because there was no change in alpha in that context in the first place. Alpha equals zero is also the same because again, you have this maximal change. You only care about the worst possible thing that can, can happen. So you, again, you're stuck with all those negative outcomes. But now in between, we now have the expectation that we have a much greater sensitivity to risk along the way. And that's exactly what you can see. So now this is the 0.05 case, but now in this nested case, and now you can see that again, the values are all much more negative than they were, than they were for, the, for the PC bar. And the same is true as you go up. So this is a more conservative measure, but it's again, it's another measure that, you, that makes sense from a coherence point of view, because you're applying the same value of alpha bar every time, whenever you get to a state. So you're not, pre, you're not uh, privileging any original start state or home or nest state in the first place. So in terms of the optimum policy, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of the optimal policy, this again was the PC VAR optimal policy. This tells you how you go about moving around the world. So you can see that, for instance, generally at higher values of um, at the highest values of risk uh, neutrality, you tend to go left at the um, uh, at the top, whereas at the lower values, as you get more and more risk sensitive, you tend to go right to avoid the to avoid the lava pit. And what we can expect is that that should be even more dramatic in the in the nested CBOC, in the uh, in the N CBOC case because you're more, because of the way that risk sensitivity works. And again, you can see that, that, again, you're more negative here in terms of your expectation of the outcomes is more negative because you apply this rule, which has this greater risk um, sensitivity as you go. And indeed, you can see that here's what the optimum policy looks like in these, in, these different, in these different states. And again, we still see the same sort of learned helplessness at the end, whereby it doesn't matter what you do, uh, the, lowest, uh, the highest value of risk um, sensitivity, at alpha equals zero, because you just imagine the worst thing that can happen will happen, and then you're then you're then you're doomed basically. In the case of the cliff, this is the PC bar for the uh, for alpha is the, the five percent um, quantile. Here's the NC bar for that quantile, and you can see that again because you are this excess risk sensitivity, you're everywhere is very unpleasant, and you actually um, have this huge. Um, you know, in fact, if you start here, if you just follow the policy without any um, probability, you know, without, if you just look at the optimal policy, it doesn't even get you towards the, the, outc the, the reward because you're so worried about falling over the cliff. So you have this really negative uh, outcome. Okay, so just to summarize on the, the major part which is of this talk, which is about risk avoidant behavior, then I'm going to talk about risk avoidant planning. So I think what we have nicely from this is we have this sort of parametric risk avoidant behavior either from this pre-committed, what we call PC bar, where we have this gambler's fallacy, um, or from NC bar. So in the PC bar case, that's where you fix a start state and worry about risk relative to that start state. We have more complex inference because we have to keep on changing our model of alpha. We have this whole tableau of the values of alpha. Um, and we have to worry about uh, moving around in that value of alpha. And indeed, other modern forms of risk avoidance, like even mean variance optimization, also have to use an extra dimension for the same reason, which is that as you've been unlucky or lucky, you have to, that means you've uh, consumed parts of your, of your variance space. You have to worry about where that, how that fits. So that actually is common to other measures of risk sensitivity too. From the nested NC bar, where we keep a single value of risk sensitivity, then we saw, as the trouble with that is, you get this excessive risk aversion. You get to be really highly risk sensitive in many cases. So if you want to operate at different values of risk aversion, you still need to have this extra dimension where you can choose which value alpha to do. You can say, am I very risk seeking today or risk sensitive today? Um, but you can plan individually, independently at, at each, um, at each uh, um, value of risk. From a psychiatric perspective, I think one good way to think about this is a, a lot of these problems are the what we consider to be the wrong problem. This is the case of the, you know, you're computing, uh, what I've shown you all together is optimum calculations, but for risk um, sensitivity, which is pathological. And that leads to pathological avoidance. So you, you know, you're unwilling, as the alpha gets lower and lower, as you get alpha goes towards zero, your unwillingness to, to explore the world or to move around gets rather greater because of all the nasty things that could potentially happen, even though they might have very low probabilities. And this focusing on the lower tail is really what makes this so clear. 
And then your choice to use a nested CVAR, which again is just a choice, you know, how should you go about choosing which problem to solve, makes that even worse. If you're thinking about the risk, you don't adjust for the fact you've already been unlucky, um, but you choose to keep at that level of unluckiness, then, um, then there's nothing much you can do about it. And in stochastic problems, alpha equals zero leads to this indifference, because the worst possible thing can happen, can always happen as you, as you go. Okay, so now uh, the last bit of the talk, I'd like to talk about um, uh, planning. So um, what I've talked so far is there are sort of two standard ways of thinking about planning. There's an sort of online way of planning, so model-based reinforcement learning, something like, say, Monte Carlo Tree Search, where we can do the operations I talked about, you know, like, like evaluate duration in this risk-sensitive case as well. But there's also the possibility of doing offline planning. And in the, in the, in the, in the world of... Um, Reinforcement, uh, neural reinforcement learning, there's a lot of interest these days in thinking about um, algorithms like Dyna, which came from Rich Sutton, in which you imagine that there's some sort of replay process that happens, in which you explore a model that you've learned of the world, and then you invert that model offline to work out what the optimum policy is. And there's evidence in rodents and also in, these days in humans using MEG showing that subjects seem to be replaying patterns of, of, of things that they learn during, when they're, they're exploring a domain and potentially using that in order to, um, in order to uh, control their behavior in an offline way. And there was a very nice analysis by Marcelo Matter and Nathaniel Dorr suggesting essentially a, a version of an algorithm known in RL by Andrew Moore called Prioritize Sweeping in which you choose which state of the world to replay. So you say, I want to optimize my offline planning to say I want to get the best possible value for this offline planning step that I do, so that when I move in the world next, I have the best chance of doing a good action. And what um, Matter and Dorr showed is that in the, in the standard risk uh, neutral case, so alpha equals one, that where you choose to update, so the place in the world you choose to think about, um, is the, comes from the product of two terms, a gain term and a need term. So gain says essentially, how much will my policy change at a state if I do an update in that state? And the need term says, how likely am I, uh, under my current policy, if you like, or under my future policy, to visit that state at which I'm going to change my policy? And the product of those two is the thing that says, you know, how it allows you to choose which state to um, go and improve your behavior at. So what we were interested in doing is saying, what happens if we apply the same rule now, but in our risk-sensitive case, where are you going to be thinking about? How is risk sensitivity going to change the parts of the world that you ruminate on or you contemplate when you're thinking about doing your planning? And like Matter and Door, we're going to assume that we're going to look at what the optimum case would be like and not worry at the moment about how you might possibly calculate that. Okay, so how does that look? So um, what I'm going to show you is starting from essentially a completely empty value space where you know nothing except for the values of the lava pit, minus 10, and the values of the two reward states, is it plus two, and, um, plus two and plus one. And then what I'm showing you in this instance is the first six steps of optimized um, replay that you would do. And so this is the case that you start here and your alpha value is equal to one, which means that your, your, you, you, um, you, your perspective is, is to have a risk neutral planning. And you can see that you, the order of planning is you start at the R equals two here, then the R, sorry, the R equals two, and then you work, then you work backwards to the start state such that you can plan to get to the R equals two um, case, which is the optimum policy in the case that you are risk neutral. As we change your, your, but this is pre-committed CVAR, you know, it depends where you start from. So now we start at this risk level of 0.3. Now you can see that you're going to explore the rest of this tableau. And interestingly, for instance, the first place that you choose to do a replay at is not even at the risk level that you're starting at, that you care about. So this works out the best thing you should do, the, the, the optimum gain you get from, a, from an action, from a replay action, from a piece of offline planning, is actually to plan at this state. And what this tells you is you're expecting to be unlucky, right, because you're because of the, the alpha of, of 0.3, and that means that you have a higher expectation of, of being at this location. The need, in a sense, the, the risk-adjusted need is going to be greater here than it is here. So this is the first one, then the second one, then the third one, and then so you then move around the places in the world in a very different way. So you, you, in this case, you can see that you focus quite a bit on aspects near to the lava pits. You spend a lot of time thinking about the lava pit at different values of alpha. 
Um, if you remember, this was the optimum policy for alpha equals 0 0.3. It tells you where all the places you, you, you go to. And that's, it, it's that way that you get to, to understand that this place in the end is going to be a place that you have to worry about. And then if alpha is 0 0.05, so now you're even more risk sensitive, you can see that you, you, you do your, your planning is even more consumed by higher risk values. You're thinking about nastier things that can happen. And it's also um, condemned by uh, values, uh, also stuck to values very near to the, to the lava pit. So you're ruminating a lot about values near to that lava pit. In NCVAR, we can do this now separately at every different level of alpha, right? Because, we, the, because our alpha levels are independent. And again, we have the same thing at alpha equals one. At alpha equals zero, it doesn't matter where you plan, nothing can help you because you're indifferent to the actions there, as I argued. And then, for instance, here, for NCVAR, so this nested CVAR, at alpha equals 0 0.5, you, you know, in, it, you, uh, you're only ever thinking about nasty things that can happen along the way to the lava pit. Whereas for higher values of alpha, you also worry about the possibility of getting, you also you know, do some planning in order to get to the, um, to the little reward. So it really changes the whole structure of the way that you go about exploring this space. And here's another example, another little simple two-dimensional maze, where there's just a single reward here and a large lava pit here. And if you prioritize an NCVAR based on risk neutrality, as you might imagine, all you do is you, it's just a way of you send one action to avoiding the lava pit. And then all the rest of the actions you, all the rest of the planning you do is how to get from the start state to the, um, to the, to the little, to the single reward in the environment. Whereas if you prioritize based on alpha bar as 0 0.1, so you have risk sensitive prioritization, you spend all your time worrying about how to avoid the lava pit from next door, from two next door to it, and from three next door to it. And you spend no time planning to get to the good outcome. And this, I think, really captures nicely the idea that you're ruminating, you're, you're, you're spending all your time contemplating catastrophe rather than thinking about the, the benefits that you could possibly have in the environment. OK, so let me just start here. So what we argued is that you're essentially solving the wrong, uh, you're solving the wrong problems. So if you have, so when we think about risk sensitivity, you know, who is it to say what a good value of risk sensitivity should be? Right? It's your choice how risk sensitive uh, you might be. So what we're seeing is behavior, which indeed the DSM definition of some of these of, uh, the aspects of anxiety disorders has to do with cases where you're making choices which seem over risk avoidant compared to the population as a whole. So here we've seen the same thing. We get this optimal dysfunctional avoidance and rumination that come from using a low alpha and using, choosing to use NCVAR, so not you know, choosing a different way of thinking about risk over sequential problems, which is the interesting case in this instance. We saw that you get this action indifference and helplessness in the case that alpha is near to zero. So as you get towards alpha zero in a stochastic world, which, you know, of course we always live in these uncertain stochastic worlds, there's just nothing you can do. And so you're, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, life is um, uh, unpleasant. And so you get this sort of effective learned helplessness from risk sensitivity. The world affords control, but you don't appreciate that because you're so risk sensitive that you think, well, you no, know, nasty things can happen even if I do have some control. You could imagine now a sort of meta control aspect where you say, you know, think about um, you know, how far should I, you know, how much time should I spend ruminating? So you could imagine having some sort of threshold for how much we want to improve the CVAR. And that means, again, we could say that some people are going to ruminate more than others because they uh, have a different threshold for how much you need to improve CVAR for the rumination itself. Something I'm very fond of that can't quite persuade Chris to work on is the idea that um, we live in a world which are really very complicated. So think about the example of you know, getting run over and you think, well, I could, my coffee could have been hotter. I could have walked more slowly down the stairs. I could have met my neighbor going down the stairs. I could have had the rubbish to throw out. You can essentially, in, in a, you can imagine a sort of non-parametric Bayesian model, sort of infinite model, where you can always generate another way of either avoiding a catastrophe or creating a catastrophe. So you know, we live in complicated worlds, and all that complexity is not, ref not reflected correctly by my nice, finite, simple models. And in those sorts of cases, if you're very risk sensitive, you give, uh, you give higher weight or high weight to unlikely things, those unlikely things come from this infinite model and make your life really, um, can make your life really um, seem to be full of uh, unpleasant risks. Um, so here we've talked, we haven't talked about risk sensitive exploration. I talked about risk in MDPs, but you can imagine using the same notion in a, in a partially observable Markov decision process or a Bayes adaptive one where you have to do exploration as well. And so risk sensitive exploration is then an obvious extension that we would uh, like to, to work on. 
Another way of thinking about, uh, often thought about risk, is that instead of um, having knowing the properties exactly and then worrying about risk, you could also think a bit about having a misspecified model. So thinking there's some uncertainty about the probabilities, and you want to be robust to that misspecification. So that's another way of thinking about aspects of the, the things a bit like CBAR that I talked about. So that's the wrong problem. In terms of the wrong solution, there are also ways that you're, so in this case, you're trying to solve the right problem, but you're doing it incorrectly. And one of the observations that people have made in the context of depression is that people with suffering from depression ruminate, also ruminate in the same way the normal people ruminate too. But it's as if people who, who are suffering from depression adopt essentially ineffective rumination strategies. They, they adopt a way of ruminating which is not effective in order to change the planning. So one possibility here is something that actually um, uh, I worked on with Quentin Hughes a long time ago, is the idea that maybe you initiate one of these offline replays, these diner replays I talked about, but maybe you have some sort of, for instance, pruning mechanism which says you're unwilling to execute, you know, to finish that pruning. You're unwilling to, to um, do the update to the plan, which will mean that then next time you get to that state, the, the system of gains has changed. It's not so, not so worried. So if you have an avoidance from the, from the rumination you do itself, you might keep on ruminating again and again and again and again because you're never actually satisfying, you're never actually solving the rumination problem that you come up with in the first place. Another thing you can imagine is that you're trying to commit to PC bar, this one which changes according to the gambler's fallacy, but you don't adjust correctly for your changing luck. You know, the fact that if you are unlucky, then now you expect things to be benign in the future. And so we can imagine something which is a bit more continuous between PC bar and then nested C bar, whereby you do incomplete updates for the cases that you're lucky or unlucky as you go. And then in terms of the wrong environment, I think something else we'd like to work on, we're only just starting, is to think about overgeneralizing representations of the world. So here, I imagined a table lookup. Every state has its own representation. So you can imagine what happens if we actually have representations where we, um, we are less specific, which is, again, something we see happens in the context of depression, people have observed in the context of depression. So now imagine being risk sensitive. So the worst possible thing that can happen, or nasty things that can happen, if you've aggregated states together by generalizing in an inappropriate way, then of course, again, you're going to have um, problems in terms of the way that you think, the nasty things that you um, believe could possibly happen in these um, instances. And so again, that can be another way of leading to problems. So altogether, I think it's a very rich domain. We've only really explored the surface of it, but um, I think some interesting um, uh, unexpected findings that we had when we started this down route into risk. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Peter, for this uh, wonderful talk. I, I'm sure we will get uh, lots of virtual uh, hand claps uh, on the chat. <laughs> Thank you.